is the second of a pair of videos from the Southampton Regional Methodist Theology Forum and is an excerpt of a meeting held in October 2021 at Romsey Methodist Church. Our speaker is Professor Merrick Shrokosh, who is based at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton and a former Associate Director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion at Cambridge and is now also a member of the National Committee for Christians in Science. He co-wrote the book Blue Planet, Blue God, The Bible and the Sea with Rebecca Watson and his talk is based on that book. This is the second section of the talk considering Blue Planet. The part of the video concentrates on Blue God. There is another um, carbon dioxide problem with the ocean and that, that's because carbon dioxide is absorbed into the ocean. Um, it makes the ocean acidic. About a quarter of what we're putting out into the atmosphere goes into the ocean. About 40% stays in the atmosphere, which is giving us our global warming and plants on land absorb the rest. There are two mechanisms going on in the ocean. There's a simple absorption of the carbon dioxide. It's called the solubility pump. And there's a biological pump, just like plants on land use carbon dioxide. Um, algae and so on in the ocean make use of the carbon dioxide. So these, both these factors take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into the ocean. But the first one, the solubility one, is leads to ocean acidification. So if you remember your chemistry from way back when you were 15 or something, pH um, is a measure of the acidity of a, uh, of a substance and it's decreased from 8.21 to 8.1, which means the oceans have become more acidic. Um, since pre-industrial times. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, except this is not linear scale, so that's actually a 25% increase in acidification. And all these things have um, impacts. So coral reefs, anybody been <gasps> scuba diving or snorkeling on a coral reef? No, I have, yeah, they're beautiful places. Um, but increasing water temperatures and acidification lead to a thing called coral bleaching. Coral, corals are actually... Um, symbiotic relationship um, and uh, the colour actually comes from little algae which I can never pronounce the name of um, that live inside the coral structures um, and when the water warms they get expelled and the coral loses its colour and eventually dies and the corals are formed of calcium carbonate which obviously dissolves in acidic uh, waters so both those factors lead to things like this which is this is the Great Barrier Reef off Australia this is bleached, you can see it's lost all its colour, it's basically dead. So I could talk about lots of other impacts of global warming and their relation to the ocean, I'm not going to, um, I'm going to um, go for a little fun break. So this is taken from the front of one of our research ships. Uh, you can occasionally see the bow wave of the ship and these are dolphins just playing around the front of the ship. They're having a great time messing around. We're not quite sure why they do this, but they come in and sort of play around the ship. It's quite fun. And here's a dolphin juggling a jellyfish. I think this was on the BBC. I don't know whether you can see it, but... Um, there, it just tossed the jellyfish. You can see the jellyfish go up in the wall. For some reason, it's juggling a jellyfish. Nobody knows why. Just one of those things. The ocean's a fascinating place. So, having talked about some of the science and so on, let's talk about um, a Christian response. Is there a Christian view? So this is my Christian view. You may not agree with me, but this is where I come from, Christian-wise. So if we think about God's story and the earth story, which is the context in which I like to uh, think about these things, we have this sort of trajectory, creation, fall, Israel, God's people, Old Testament, Jesus' birth, death and resurrection, which is obviously central to our faith, the church, God's people in the New Testament, Jesus returns, true humanity, Jesus is described as the new Adam and so on. And then you've got the new creation in Revelation 21 and 22. So I see that um, whole picture. God is interested in the whole of his creation because you can see that trajectory through scripture from creation through to new creation. Uh, as Christopher Wright, who's an Old Testament uh, scholar, points out, very often Christians start with the fall, Genesis 3, and uh, Jesus' um, birth, death, and resurrection are a, a solution to the problems in Genesis 3, our sin. Which is true, I'm not denying that. But we need to look at a bigger picture and put it in a bigger context. So if you read Romans 8, I'm not going to quote all of it. 
in the context of Romans 8, it talks about the creation being set free from slavery to decay at the same time as the sons of God are set free. So in other words, God's plan, if you like, is to rescue the whole of creation, both us and the planet. So I like to think about, it's, you know, we, we're a bit, in the West we're very individualistic in our way of thinking about these things. God is more uh, holistic. He's concerned about the whole of his creation. And then the question that that raises is, how should we live in the light of these things as Christians? So being simple-minded, I like to go back to the basics of um, my faith. And you can't get more basic than Jesus' two commandments, which I'm sure as a bunch of Methodist ministers you will know. Not everybody does, but you should, you should do. <laughs> so the first uh, greatest commandment is to love God. So the earth is God's gift to us. He's given it to us to look after. If you go back to Genesis um, in the garden, they're told to look after the garden. You can expand that to say we have to look after the whole of the creation. And it belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's. It's not ours to do with as we wish. So if I borrow something off you, um, say I borrowed your car and then deliberately ran it off the road and smashed it up, it would hardly be a measure of my relationship with you in terms of it wouldn't be a good relationship. I felt good with impunity just smash up your possessions because I just felt like it but Christopher Wright makes this point about the earth trashing someone else's property is incompatible with any claim to love the other person if we claim to love God which we do as Christians then we have to ask ourselves what are we doing in terms of how we treat his creation what's our response what should we be doing um, how should we be living and he also says um, our treatment of the earth will be a measure of our relationship with the creator if we claim to have a relationship with God what does that imply for how we live and how we act? I like this because when I talk to uh, slightly less theologically educated audiences, most people can grasp the first and second commandment and that we need to respond to this. Because you can go, you know, the book's got lots of theological subtleties and stuff in it. But in the end, it's very simple. In the end, do we love God? Do we love my next point would be love our neighbour. I like to go back to these basic things because I think for most people that's something they can get to grips with. Are we doing something that um, is incompatible with our love for God? And then the second commandment is possibly even more um, telling in the sense it says love our neighbour. Well, in this globalised world that we live in, who is our neighbour? You know, Jesus was asked, who's my neighbour? Well, actually, in terms of globalization, global impacts, everybody's my neighbor in that sense. What we do here is we're not isolated from what's happening um, in the Indian Ocean where the Maldives are slowly disappearing because sea level is riding, rising and the Maldives probably won't exist as a place in, if we carry on the way we're going. Um, and some of the places in uh, the Pacific Islands as well are disappearing under sea level rise. In fact, I think, I can't remember which island it is now, but they've made arrangements to evacuate their 10,000 um, people on the island in, to uh, New Zealand in due course. Well, 10,000 is probably a number you can evacuate, but if you think about it, like the 10 million um, in Bangladesh or some of the other places, um, you know, the 410 million that the newspaper said were at risk, they're trickier to move around the planet. So the question is, are our actions causing harm to others elsewhere on the planet? And the clear answer is yes, because we are using coal, gas and oil. Maybe not so much coal these days. Um, but, you know, we all drive cars, I suspect. Is there anybody here who doesn't drive a car? That would be most unusual. No. <laughs> so we are, our actions are having an effect on others elsewhere. So you get CO2 emissions, global warming, sea level rise, droughts, floods, environmental refugees. It's mainly affecting poor people. Um, you know, we're quite well insulated from some of the consequences. But even in this country, people are starting to get the message because of lots of the flooding that's happened recently. And in California, you've had the wildfires in Australia and places like that. People are beginning to wake up that the consequences are not just necessarily for the poor of the world. Some of them will affect us. So this is an interesting verse I came across, um, which slightly um, I found a bit, um, bit worrying. So this is Revelation. 
The time has come for judging the, wet, the dead and rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who reveal your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. I find that quite worrying in the sense that am I one of the ones destroying the earth? Am I contributing to God's creation in a positive way or in a negative way? And that's quite a challenge to me, I find. There's the positive things about obeying Jesus' commandments, but there's also the negative things that God may not see what we're doing in a particularly... Um, good light. And just in case people think that these things are new, because often I, you know, you know, people say, you know, we've only got started thinking about these things in the last few, few tens of years. I found this quote from Hildegard of Bingen. Um, it says, prophetess, so I assume she was regarded as a prophetess at the time, but she was an abbess of a, an abbey, some, I think in Germany, I could be Bingen, I'm not sure that's Germany or Holland, anyway, somewhere in Europe. And she wrote, we shall awake from our dullness and rise vigorously towards justice. If we fall in love with creation deeper and deeper, we'll respond to its endangerment with passion. And she was saying that a thousand years ago. This is not a new Christian message. It's not a clever reinterpretation. It's not you know, like some, uh, some of the sections of the American community would like to say it's all been made up by us in the last few years. Christians have been concerned about these things for th- thousands of years. If you think about Celtic Christianity, they had a, a great concern about the creation uh, and an interaction with the creation that we've probably lost. So actually, that's taken me less time than I imagined. So God's story and their story. So to me, they both present a challenge to understand what we're doing and how it's re- to the earth and how it's responding and to live in a way that cares for both people and planet. So as a scientist, point one is what I'm doing. I'm working on trying to understand what's happening with the creation how it's changing, uh, what we're doing to it. And point two, um, as a Christian, I mean, I'm doing both these things as a Christian, but as a Christian, I feel called by God to think about how we live in a way that cares for both the people and the planet, because both are of concern to God. So just to tie up things, a couple of lighter notes to finish on. I don't know if anybody's seen this clip before. Sit there. I don't know whether they accidentally dropped the rugby ball over the side and the whale retrieved it, or whether they, they thought they'd play a game with the whale. But it's crazy, yeah. And that goes on for a while. I won't run. Say too. hello to this beautiful. This is another. This is. Um, I don't know how well this is going to come out. I need to turn the lights down. I think to see this. Let me just um, stop that a minute. Okay. I don't know whether it still doesn't come out. Real. These are actually dolphins. They're fluorescing. It's the same, the same image that I you can't really see it very well in this light, unfortunately. But you know, there you can see the dolphins. Uh, they're on the bow wave of the ship again. But this is at night time. And they fluoresce in the dark. And that's because... Sorry, you can probably... There's this great poem, which I like, by James Fenton. Dip your hand in the water, watch the current shine, seen the blaze trail from your fingers. There are fireflies on the island, fireflies in the trees, and he's talking about they cluster in one tree, and in the coral shallows there are fireflies of the sea. And these things that fluoresce are bioluminescent dinoflagellates, it's a bit of a mouthful. They contain substance called luciferase and luciferin that allow them to luminesce when disturbed. So if you, we did um, a little thing on a cruise, we just stuck a bucket over the side of the ship, brought it on deck, and then give it a bit of a waggle with our fingers, and you've got like little lights twinkling in the bucket. It's quite impressive. But it's even more impressive when you see the dolphins ahead of the ship. And as they're going through the water, they are disturbing the dinoflagellates who fluoresce. It's thought to be a defense mechanism. Nobody's quite sure how it's supposed to work. It might be that it signals larger predators, fish, that they're being attacked by a smaller predator, the zooplankton. So in other words, the fish come and eat the zooplankton, thus saving the phytoplankton. This is sort of a burglar alarm or call the policeman response. We're not sure whether it's that or it might induce a startle response in the predators so when they flash, 
the predators get startled by that and stop feeding. We're not quite sure how. But it's a really fascinating topic. So, I think I'm almost done. Blue planet, blue god. So the ocean and the creatures in it have intrinsic, not just instrumental value. They're good, created by a good god of value in themselves and need to be looked after. Aspects of the ocean are simultaneously sacred and scary, even chaotic, but ultimately God is in control and it's a reminder of our human finitude, finitude, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. When I've been at sea, sat in the middle of the Atlantic in a big storm, you realise how puny we are as human beings and how little control we have over much of the planet. Um, we tend to forget that. We tend to think we can solve the problems. I gave a talk on geoengineering on Saturday where we think we can technologically solve climate change, which I think is a, an exhibition of human hubris. Our arrogance in thinking that we can uh, do things when we can't really. And then the Earth is blue, 71% ocean, and I think God is also blue because of our treatment of his good creation. And humans are meant to care for creation, following the example of Jesus, the servant king, not to lord it over or exploit creation. Some people read the early passages in, in uh, Genesis to say to rule and subdue. So uh, if you think about ruling, the prime example of a good ruler is Jesus, who came to serve so we're here to rule, to serve God's creation. And subdue doesn't mean over-exploit. It means bring order, um, bring wholeness, I think. That would be my sort of interpretation of those verses. You can argue me with me about that or not, but I think Jesus is our example. And if we're going to rule over creation, we need to rule like Jesus would rule, as a servant. And I think we'll just finish with a prayer of St. Brendan. Help me to journey beyond the familiar and into the unknown. Give me the faith to leave old ways and break fresh ground with you. So, you know, I think in these areas we need to leave the old ways and break fresh ground to do new things in serving God. Christ of the mysteries, I trust you to be stronger than each storm within me. I trust in the darkness and know that my times even now are in your hand. Tune my spirit to the music of heaven and some me, somehow make my obedience count for you. We want our obedience to God to make a difference and we pray that it will. So thank you very much for listening. You don't have to clap. You don't have to clap, but you can do. <laughs> Oops. Just before we stop, advertising. <laughs> my book is on sale, half price from me, if you're interested. Thank you very much. And mine's eight pounds, so there. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, thank you.